Shall we open our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 35? Isaiah chapter 35. And we want to draw your attention to really the whole chapter. We are going to start the book Leviticus, and um, I think it's important that we take a look at Isaiah chapter 35, because the book of Isaiah has to deal with really the holiness of the Lord. But the book of Leviticus has to deal with the Levites. And so one of the things that's interesting to me is how most of us have jumped over the book of Leviticus, because in just reading it, it seems pretty boring and the names and genealogy, but if you are on staff full-time and you understand that that's what you do for a living, then you kind of don't jump over it. And it really has to deal with, Genesis has to deal with really the beginning, and then the book of Exodus has to deal with redemption, how God has redeemed us. But the question comes that God has redeemed us, then what now? And that question would be, after I get saved, I am to worship the Lord with all my heart. So really, the book of Leviticus is about worshiping God, about establishing the Levites, about talking about the high priest, about how they come before God and what they do. So I promise you I'll make it as fun as I can. A couple of things that is interesting that when you kind of look at the book of Leviticus is that you can eat anything you want because of the New Testament. But if you have lobster or you have halibut, you just might want to pray a little bit more diligent in your prayer life. Because it's fine to eat, but God condemned it. The only reason why is because why? They are scavengers. They eat dead meat at the bottom of the ocean. So next time you have a halibut, think about that. Next time you enjoy that juicy lobster, it probably has bacteria in it. But all things are sanctified by what? Prayer. So just pray. You might not want to skip that prayer. And so that's okay. You can have it. And the same thing goes with, um, you know, if it has fins, then it doesn't eat. It eats living things like trout and things like that. Sharks out, swordfish is out, trout's in, things like that. Then if it jumps, you can eat it, but if it crawls, you can't eat it. You say, what's up with that, Pastor Steve? Well, if it crawls, it gets a whole bunch of germs. If it jumps, it just gets a germ, a germ, a germ, a germ. <laughs> so it's a little safer to eat it. And so that's it's okay. You can have grasshoppers. You can, you know, John the Baptist dipped them in honey and sucked those things really good, those grasshoppers. So good protein. But if it crawls on the ground, don't want it. You can do it now if you want. Just make sure you pray. And then, again, one of the great verses about hygiene is that if you have to use or relieve yourself, then go outside the camp and dig a hole with a shovel that you have and bury it and do your thing. The reason why, we don't want dysentery inside the camp and everyone getting really sick. So it talks about some very practical things in your life. And I think you're going to really have a great time. But more than that, it talks about how to worship God. And so Isaiah chapter 35 deals with holiness, the highway of holiness. And I hear many people, even myself, saying that, boy, I really desire revival. Because either it's going to be judgment or it's going to be revival. But what scares me to death is that revival usually comes on the heels of a work of holiness among people, where God begins to sanctify. God begins to put upon certain people's hearts to really seek Him with all their heart that they might find Him. And the Bible says, today is the day, and if you seek me, you will find me. But the problem is, is that we see people looking at holiness, we realize that sin is growing quicker and more rapid. And the Bible says in the very last days that sin is going to be everywhere. And many are going to fall away before the great day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in my life, I look back now, what really do I want God to do? And I desire God to sanctify my life, to set it apart, and begin to help me really understand the heart of God. And so I realize I fall short. But it's the holiness of God that one day I'm going to see face to face. And so this is a very profound thing. It really is a message of hope that God can touch someone who's unholy and teach them how to be right. He took Isaiah and touched his lips. And then Isaiah said, send me, I'll speak for God. You remember it was Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego that were in the fire. But when the Lord came in, then they did not want to get out. So God help me not to get out of a trial too quick. Help me, God, to learn the lessons you want. And once again, 
purify my life and touch it. When I walk through the fire, you're going to be with me. When the waters come upon me, you're going to be over with me. In other words, help me not to be overwhelmed. And when I'm overwhelmed and fearful, it's not trusting God. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so as I get to know God and begin to understand His character and His nature, that's what Peter was talking about. We've been blessed with that divine nature, partakers of God's nature. And God's nature is to not live in immorality, but to seek after those things that are right before God, to be right. And so those, once again, he brings restoration to those who are oppressed. And there are moments when I'm really oppressed. And God says, I will bring that moment in your life to those who are downtrodden. And there are many times you become downtrodden, but God can restore. God has the ability. And then we realize to those who are devastated, maybe a death, maybe a child that has died, maybe the news of terminal cancer, whatever it might be. God has the ability and God has the ways of touching and healing your life. It also is a psalm about really the millennial kingdom, about once again God working in the nation of Israel. And it has to also deal with a wonderful thing about God's highway. And there are two roads. There is the highway and there is that low way. And when you take God's way, it is absolutely incredible. He'll make the bumpy paths smooth. He'll take those crooked areas and make them straight. He'll take the high mountains and bring them down. He'll take the valleys and bring them up. And the moment you turn to God, you are going to find yourself on the way back to God, and the way of the Father is now running to the prodigal son to bless you. So as we take a look at this, four things I want to share with you this morning about worship. And four questions I have. Number one, why should I worship? Why in the world should I really worship and try to share my heart and express myself when I come to fellowship or by myself? And I think the answer is only God restores. And so the first one I begin to realize, God is the one that restores my life. No one else is going to do that. Your wife is not going to restore you. Your children are not going to do it. Your work might not do it. Your church will not do it. They might try to do it and do it for a season. But the restoration and the restoration you're looking for is inside of your heart. And no one can get inside of your heart except the world, or the power of the Holy Spirit. And when I've gone after the things of the world, like Peter, I've warmed myself at the camp of the enemy, then I need the fire of the Spirit of God, like Jesus cooking over the disciples, that I might experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I'm desperate for God to rework what I have destroyed in my life. And so I can search my whole life who's going to restore me. If I could find my dad or if I could make things right at home or if I could find my birthright, if I could find this or that, it's not going to do it for you. It will bring certain joy, but it will not restore you. And so he says here in Isaiah 35, verses 1 and 2, he says, God can restore or God can change your wilderness. And notice what he says in verse 1. The wilderness of solitary place shall be glad for them. And so the first thing we realize is that every one of us has a wilderness. Israel had a wilderness they had to go through for about 11 days. They turned it in to 40 years because of their disobedience, because of their murmuring and complaining and all the things they were doing. They hurt and deceived and really devastated what God wanted to do in their life. And so they were now bound for that wilderness, and they were now going to die in that wilderness. And I think many times we find ourselves in that wilderness. We look around, we see nothing happening. We look in the mirror, and we see a tumbleweed. We look outside, and we see everybody else. They have little green things on, and they're growing. But I look at my life, and it's just the wilderness. I've been in it for a long time. My marriage is the wilderness. My children bring me to the wilderness. My job is definitely the wilderness. I find myself in the wilderness of life. And all of a sudden, I can see God move. I can see the Shekinah glory. I can see the manna. But yet, I'm still in that incredible wilderness. I can even see God work. But I kind of get used to that wilderness. And I want to tell you, 
that God is here to get you out of that wilderness and bring you into gladness. And there's two reasons why. Number one, for us, because we like to see a little bit of joy in your life once in a while. And number two, for you, because God wants to heal you and God wants to show you that that wilderness, that overwhelming depression, that overwhelming who I am and I don't fit in, God will turn to gladness. In fact, when you look in the mirror and see that tumbleweed, this is what you have to think. Lord, I don't see you on the outside, but I know that you never leave me nor forsake me. So therefore, I believe you've gone underground to work in my heart, and next year I'm going to produce fruit like you've never seen before. And that's exactly what God's going to do. So I cannot judge things on the outside. Sometimes God has to prune, and sometimes I feel like God how much more of this wilderness can I go through? And Moses went through it, and Paul went through it, and Philip went through it. Every one of God's people, Naomi went through it, Esther went through it. There's always a wilderness, but there's a way out. And so he says, I will give you gladness. The second thing we see in verse 1, I'll take your desert and I'll turn it into a place of rejoicing. And there's no doubt that we've been in that desert. Someone pats us on the back, and dust comes off of us. All of a sudden, they say, how are you doing? <coughs> okay, I'm just kind of really dry and empty. And you look at their eyes, and it's like I've been out here for 150 years. And they're just desolate. And they're doing their job, but there's no joy in their life. And they're doing what they have to do at home, but they're just going through the routine. The kids don't want to get too close. Wife doesn't want to say too much. And all of a sudden, he, we give him his space or we give her his space. And we find out that that's not the will of God. Philip, when he was called out of that revival, came to the desert. And the Bible said he was in that desert. He was looking and searching. And when God showed him the Ethiopia, he ran to be obedient. Now, when you can run in your desert and you can sing in your desert, God has really a hold of your life. And he can give you joy unspeakable full of glory. And so the desert can turn into a place of rejoicing. Paul, for three years, was in that area of the desert, but God taught him the Word of God. Joseph was in that prison for 13 years, but when he came out, he ruled the world. We see over and over again there are wilderness and deserts in our life. And then the third thing mentioned in verse 2, he says this barren area, it shall be blossom abundantly. In other words, rejoicing even with joy and singing. And so that barrenness is now going to be abundant. And sometimes that barrenness is like I'm not producing. I have nothing in my stomach. There's no life coming out. I've gone through the change of life. No more babies. My kids are gone. The old empty nest syndrome. I need to find kids, I need to bring kids, hang out with kids, go over the children's ministry, fulfill your heart, be a great thing to do. But there's that desire to have life around you. You look at your husband, I need a baby, something to bring life to me. And so that barrenness, but here's what I want to share with you. The great women of the Bible, they were barren. And the reason why is God was going to bring a blessing that they couldn't even contain. And so the great women of the Bible, they were barren till God came upon them. And God did a work. And so we see that over and over again. I'm not producing. But when God gets a hold of you, when that holiness comes upon your life, you are going to be abundant. And it's going to be the blessings of God and the gladness of God and the rejoicing of God. And so God is going to change you. And then he says he's going to fill your heart. And notice in verse 2, his glory will be upon Lebanon. In other words, the trees of Lebanon were absolutely gorgeous trees. The trees are going to be the glory of God. His beauty will be upon Carmel in verse 2. The excellence of Carmel. And then in verse 2, His fruitfulness upon Sharon. So every place you go, God's going to bless. It might be Sharon. It might be Lebanon. It might be over here. It might be at work. It might be at home. It might be at church. No matter where you go, what you do, because God is in you and God's with you, you are going to begin to grow. And you can no longer say, Jesus is in my heart, don't judge me. No, if Jesus is in your heart, there ought to be a little bit of joy outside once in a while. Amen? No, you don't believe that. I do. I believe the joy's in your heart. Get it out. In other words, why is it not coming out? Because I have two lives going on inside, the devil and the Lord. 
And I need to make a decision. Who am I going to listen to? Am I going to go after the things of the world and not be restored? Or do I go for the one that can restore everything in my life? Take the dryness and fill it. Take the emptiness and make it blossom. Take my life at this age and explode it. Who do I want? And the answer very clearly to me is I'm going to rejoice because God, you're the one who can do this. And so when I worship, it's because there's no one else like you. You are the great God, and I thank you for restoring my life. Secondly, why do I worship? Only God redeems. And this is kind of real in my own life. Why am I going to worship today? Because not only have you restored me, but you redeemed me. And here it says in verse 3, You have redeemed my hands. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Now the hands are hanging down. It's like you come to church and your hands are hanging down. And you say, are you going to do dishes tonight? I can't do it. I can't lift my hands anymore. You know? Are you going to work? Can't go to work anymore my hands. I, what it means is I'm depressed. I'm overwhelmed. I'm despondent. I can't do no more. I've had it. I can't even lift my hands and praise you. I can't even pull the bed back. I just want to go die somewhere. And all of a sudden, your hands that were so active, helping and ministering and changing diapers and doing dishes and working and doing this and that, now I just want to die in this couch. I can't even, I can't even put a, pa a potato chip in my mouth and get it in my mouth anymore. And I just, my hands are dead. And what it means is I'm overwhelmed with life. In other words, I, I don't see an answer. I listen to the news. There's no answer. I watch television. There's no answer. I watch the 7 Hundred Club. There's no answer. I watch the government. There's no answer. And all of a sudden, I just start giving up. I can't do it. No one's going to make a difference. And that's what Elijah did. I'm the only one. And God says, I have 7,000 that have not bowed their knee. And it means, actually, I'm exhausted. And, and the word means I'm just overwhelmed. And once again, I'm useless. I'm powerless. Kind of like the man with a withered hand. But Jesus said to that man, stretch it forth. And he willed to obey. He knew he couldn't do it. He knew he couldn't even try. But in his mind, he willed it. And that's all that God needed. I'll strengthen your hands. I'll pick them back up. I'll help you once again to lift them before my name and worship me. And Hebrews goes on to say in chapter 12, verse 12, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down. So I'm hanging down. Lift them up. There was a time I remember at Costa Mesa 35 years ago. And there was a system pastor. His name was Laverne Romaine. We'd never call him L.E. Romaine. But he was a drill instructor for 28 years. The old type of drill instructor in the Marines. I mean, just devastatingly nasty. And so he was chosen by Chuck to help me grow up. So one day I came down to Romaine and I was just really sad and overwhelmed and discouraged and kind of depressed. And I walked in. I said, Romaine, I just am going through a tough time. He said, well, that's understandable. Come with me. So I'm thinking, well, here, what a great man. He's going to help me. And so I walked into the front office and he said, everyone stop. And all the secretaries stopped. There's about 10 secretaries. Everyone stop. I want to introduce you to a man who does not believe in God, who does not believe what he teaches, who does not do what God wants him to do. He teaches it, but doesn't live it. He told you to strengthen your hands, but look at his hands. He told you to trust God, but he's unwilling to trust God. I just want everyone to know, don't listen to his Bible studies anymore. <laughs> and I walked outside like, what just happened? He looked at me and says, you hypocrite, get out of here. And that was like, took me quite a while to let that sink in, but he was absolutely right. I was preaching it, not living it. Talking about it, not doing it. And I tell you what. It means against all odds, you lift your hands. It means when you feel terrible, you lift your hands. When you're ready to give up, you lift your hands. Because without God, you're dead. That's what he's talking about. And the lesson rivets into my heart why I have to be so real and transparent up here. So I thank God for him. And then secondly, not only in my hands, but notice my knees. And verse 3, he will redeem my knees. The word confirm is an interesting word. It means once again to establish, to fortify, to be alert, to increase, to be bold. Now, I have fulfilled that. I have double knee titanium knees. 
And I found that out in the last accident I got into. I ran into a head-on collision out in the parking lot with one of these poles. And um, the pole won $28,000 worth of damage to my car. But my knee went through the dash. I felt pretty good about that. So don't mess with me because I'll knee you. You know, I'll just hit you right in the knee with my knee and break your knee. I have titanium knees, and so they cut off my kneecaps, put titanium in there with a little piece of plastic. That good for 10,000 miles, he said. <laughs> I'm serious. Now, if I gain a bunch of weight, it goes down 7,000 miles. That's it. At the end, he goes in. He cuts the little back of it one inch, pulls the plastic up, puts a new piece of plastic in, two stitches. I have another 10,000 miles to go. So I am strengthened. I can walk. And people always, it's so funny, this church. They, they walk, and they talk to me real carefully, and they listen. They want to hear that click. You know, they're like crazy people here, you know. Now I have titanium back, and so everything goes off at the Pentagon. And when I go through the airport, I mean, it really goes off loud, much louder than a little pocket knife. Beep, 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 you know, titanium. So God has strengthened my knees. Why? So I can walk. Oh, I don't feel like going. I don't want to do it. I hurt too bad. You know something? You can do it. And so many times, go to church. I don't want to go to church. Get going. I can't do it. I heard all over. God will strengthen you. God will take your desire, your heart, your will, and do it. And then lastly, notice here, not only will he redeem my hands, redeem my knees, but he'll redeem my heart. And verse 4, say to them that are of a fearful heart, that's none of you, right? Say to all of you that are of a fearful heart, be strong. What a word of God no one has ever said that in counseling. Oh, you're so afraid. I'm afraid too. No, you're afraid. Be strong. That's a little aggressive, isn't it? No, that's exactly what you need to hear. You need to be strong in the Lord. God's going to have the final say. And God's going to win. God's wins are all wins and no losses. He's going to destroy the Antichrist, make a brand new heaven and earth. God's going to put your marriage back together. God's going to bring those kids back. God will have the final say. And so here, he says, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even with recompense. The word means with retribulation. He will come and save you. That's what he's saying. Listen, I'll help you. I'll help you. I'll take away the fear. God hasn't given you that fear power and love and of a sound mind. And I will strengthen your hands, I will strengthen your heart, and I will strengthen your knees to get back into the work of God. In other words, I am a God that can redeem that which is broken. And when your knees are down and your back is out and your life is gone, you something I want to teach you. In my weakness, your strength is going to be made perfect. So the second reason I want to lift my hands today is because, God, you have redeemed everything. Third, why shall I worship? Number three, only God revives. This is really cool. In other words, He can heal you. No, you can fix things, but you can't make them jump. Like, for instance, in science, you can take a frog apart. Amen? But put it back together, make it jump. Can't do that. <laughs> I can take people apart. They don't jump no more. You know, I try to fix people, but they're even broken more. Well, because I don't have what it takes, I don't have life. I'm not breathing into my children life. I'm breathing into them discouragement. I'm breathing into them fear and overwhelmness. I'm not breathing into them the spirit of the living God. Honey, God would take care of that. Honey, there have been times in my life I've gone through that, but God can do that. Wives are falling apart because husbands are not breathing into them the reality of Jesus Christ. And when I see a, a bent reed, I want to cut it off, cut that thing off. It looks out of place, and that's what we do. Or I see a f smoking flack. It's like a barbecue smoking. We want to hose it down. And what God is saying is don't touch that smoking flack. Well, why? Because it's so much smoke coming in the house. Breathe upon it, and the coals were light once again. Oh, okay. The breath of God can relight it. The breath of God can revive you. The breath of God can give you a brand new heart for your spouse and for your children and for the worship of God. And then don't cut that bruised reed because God can bring that sap right back in it and make it stand straight again. Give it a chance. And as Christians, we cut things and throw things away. We don't give God a chance to work in our hearts and lives. 
And so we see that to the blind in verse 5, you're going to see. Well, God, I'm not blind. Well, we're blind spiritually. We don't understand what's going on in the world. We think everything's going to get better. We're ignorant to really how bad things really are. God, open my eyes to where we really are. I need to start praying for revival. God, open my eyes to where we are as a couple. God, open my eyes to where my kids are. Show me what's going on. Don't, God, I need my eyes open. And secondly, in verse 5, God, I need my ears open. I'm not hearing your voice anymore. I'm hearing music and I'm hearing everything that's bad type of things. I'm hearing bad jokes, but I'm not hearing your love for me. I'm not giving you time to pull that foreskin off of my ear so I can hear the Word of God and remember what the Bible says. In the last days, in the book of Amos, there's going to be a famine of the Word. People aren't going to hear the Word. They're going to put churches like this out of business because they want to tickle ears. They don't want to preach the truth. And then he says in verse 6, the lame is going to leap. And what does it mean? It means, well, you know, I'm just kind of walking and just going through life. It means you're going to have a spring on your feet. You're going to be able to jump all over the place. And Habakkuk is a great example. I looked through the icebox. It was empty. I looked to the barn. It was empty. I looked to my fields, and it was empty. I looked around. Everything's gone. And all of a sudden, he starts jumping up, turning around. And it means he was rejoicing because of who God was. In other words, I can still see God in the midst of everything going bad. In other words, he believed in God. And Moses was able to see God through the situation. Nehemiah was able to see God through the rubbish. And you can see God through all the things you're going through. And then in verse 6, he makes the dumb will sing. In other words, I I don't want to sing. Well, you need to sing. Why? Give me one good reason why I need to sing. Because God has restored you. And God has redeemed you. And God is willing to breathe into you the, the spirit of life. Unbelievable what God can do. God wants to touch you. And then in verse 6, once again the water is going to break forth. The wilderness show water break out and streams in the desert. You ever read that book, Streams in the Desert? That's where she got this verse. And all of a sudden we realize, hey, in my wilderness there's a stream. And the Bible says under me there's a river of God. Maybe I just need to dig down a little bit. And God's going to do the work. And there's going to be streams where I can just sit down and enjoy And verse 7, the dry area is going to be a pool. There's nothing like having a swimming pool. Dry area. I'm soaking in it, man. Floating in it. And the parched ground shall become a pool. (coughs) And now torrents of living water. What happened to you? People are going to say, well, I got touched. Who touched you? God did. Well, I need some of that. Okay, let's do it. All of a sudden, you get together with all your buddies. How are you doing? (coughs) Dusty, out of God's will, maybe going to heaven, maybe going to hell, not sure. Pass that bud, will you? I'm thirsty. How about pass that Holy Spirit and let me be drenched in the Spirit of God? God, get a hold of my heart. And lastly, why should I worship? Only God renews. Only God will give you a second chance. People don't give second chances. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But God will give you chance after chance after chance. And there are two ways you can walk, two highways. He says in verse 8, A highway shall be there, a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. And notice verse 9, No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the Redeemer shall walk therein. So this road is for the redeemed. And verse 10, And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with song and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing is gone. Oh, man. And so this is it. There's There's a road. And God says, I will renew you but you have to choose my way well god what is that way it's a highway and as i said in the very beginning of the study he'll make my way back to god unbelievably easy the way of the transgressor is hard he'll take every bumpy area and make it smooth he'll take every crooked way and make it straight he'll take every valley and fill it up and every mountain and bring it down And when Naomi left Bethlehem, 
She went over here to Moab, which she should have never done. Moab were cursed people of God. She took her husband and two boys. Her two boys got married. One got married to Ruth. Her husband died, and the two sons died in Moab. Naomi came back and said to the girls, Go back and worship your gods. And Ruth said, Where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your God will become my God. Wherever you go, I'm going to go with you. And Naomi said, I'm going back to Bethlehem. They don't like people from Moab back there. And she says, I don't care. So the moment she stepped towards Bethlehem, the Bible says there was a harvest taking place. Not a famine, a harvest. And the moment they stepped into the ground, they were in the field of Boaz. And the moment Boaz saw Ruth, he got all excited. And he told his guy on top of the cart, push a bunch of wheat towards her, handfuls of purpose towards Ruth. So Ruth now is walking home to Naomi's house where she was staying, and Naomi said, what in the world happened to you? She goes, I was in this field, Boaz, and he gave me all this stuff, and all of a sudden Naomi said, my goodness, that is going to be your husband. And it just so happened that Ruth and, you know, Boaz, they had Jesse, and Jesse had down the road David, and David had Jesus, you know. So Moabites are now in the genealogy. So everything worked out when they took a step back. When they went this way, everyone died. This way, everyone lived. This way, there's a highway, a great highway. And the, where, the people who are evil cannot be on it. It says here as we close up in verse 8, a highway should be there and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. In other words, they can't even get on it. But it shall be for those. The wayfaring man, though fools, shall not err thereon. He's not going to trip on it and be on this road. No, it, this, this road is yours and God's. And it's only for holy people. And that's what God's saying very powerfully. He's saying, listen, two roads, two thoughts, two different gods. One God will take you down. The other God will take you up. One God will say... I can do all these things but can't do anything. The other God will say, I'll take your hands, I'll take your knees, I'll take your body, I'll take every part of your life, and I will strengthen them. I'll take your mind and I'll make it alert. Not only that, I'll take the barrenness, I'll take the emptiness, I'll take the desert, I'll take the wilderness and fill it with the power of the Holy Spirit. And not only that, I'm going to open your eyes and open your ears and open your heart and open your feet and open everything about you because I'm going to do something in your life. And by the way, when it finally comes to choosing, I'll show you which way to go. Now, who do you want? Do you want this way that goes to heaven or this one over here that says, hey, let's get drunk. Hey, let's have that joint. Hey, let's do this. Hey, let's do that. And doesn't speak the truth, and all of a sudden you've lost everything. You lose everything here. You have everything here. Over here, you might have material things, but what shall prosper a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul over here? You might lose some things, but you are going to be the happiest person in the world. Now, what do you want? Do you want material things with no relationship, or would you rather have that sugar shack, just you and your husband? You see, we mess ourselves up. Amen?